Hello and welcome to Inform Friday. I'm Lila Angelaka and I work for Historic Environment Scotland in the Technical Research Unit. As mentioned in our first Inform Friday Live, this is a new series of discussions about traditional buildings where we will be presenting a short topic each time followed by live Q&A. We will also introduce you to our Inform series. These are short publications giving technical advice for homeowners and covering uh, the basics on a number of subjects and topics to try and get you to appreciate the key things to know and ask for when uh, dealing or thinking about works in older buildings. So each lesson will be corresponding to one or more of our published guides. Uh, a few weeks ago, we briefly discussed the makeup and key features of a traditional building in general. And today we'll look more closely at floors. These include floors made of timber, stone, and those colored tiles, which uh, are called encaustic tiles. So if you would like to ask us a question, you can do this now via Facebook page or log into your um, our YouTube channel with your Google account. Also, the event will be recorded and available afterwards to watch in your own time. And if we don't manage to answer your question today, we will endeavor to do so at the next session if it's relevant or if it's quite something quite specific, we will ask you to email us at technicalresearch at hs.scot. Right, it's time to welcome our guest, um, our contributor to our today's event, Roger Curtis, our technical research manager. He will go through the different types of traditional floors and I will chip in with common maintenance advice and we'll touch a bit on installation options. Uh, hello, Roger, let's get started. Hi, thank you, Leela. Hi, everyone, and welcome back for this uh, the second session. So as Leela said, we're, we're just gonna run through kind of basic floor types and uh, pick out some interesting details and things. We're gonna be tight for time. We're gonna take questions after each, each sort of floor area. So that's how we'll do it. So as has been mentioned, we've got uh, suspended timber floors, we've got uh, stone or sometimes called flagstone floors and then we've got a kind of a range of what we might call ceramic tiles um of course there are other floor types around but we'll just stick to to these ones for now so um you may remember this image from before which are sort of generic image of a of a larger traditional building a kind of upscaling of the cottage we looked at um and so in the porch as you went through that front door you might have some of the uh, glazed tile wear that, uh, or encaustic tiles that came in the late 19th century. Um, before that, when the building was built, that might have been flagstones in the hallway or in the rooms, kitchen and back rooms. And then if you went left or right through the front door into one of the public rooms here, you'd have um, some of the suspended timber floor types that we're talking about. So in terms of, um, of, of the suspended timber floor makeup, uh, we've got, um, an arrangement of joists and uh, and floorboards, which uh, are based into the the foot of the wall. So if we go onto the uh, the wall footing image, um, that will put that in context. Uh, you can see the joist goes into the wall normally, sort of six to eight inches or so. You've got that void underneath the timber work uh, and the solum, which is the earth underneath the underneath the house, um, with the footings. And that air vent there shown, which is an important part of keeping the solemn void um, free of moisture, etc. For a bit more detail, you can see the a close up of the of the joist there, um, and the tongue and groove flooring, normally a softwood uh, redwood, uh, which is butted against, fastened down with nails, and then you get to the edge of the wall, and you've got the skirting, which I've shown in this my kind of clumsy drawing, but it gives you the gives you the rough idea, uh, boxed out, and then meeting up with the lath and plaster coming down so that's the sort of pretty much the the, the 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 basic makeup of that if we go up to the uh to the first floor um so lift our eyes up to the ceiling of the first floor there's a different type of flooring arrangement which i'm calling an intermediate floor uh, where you've got the lath and plaster lining on the underside you've got the joists running parallel as you can see there in the normal way but what's slightly different with intermediate floors is they tend to have what's sometimes called deafening uh, in Scotland or pugging in England, which is a, a thinnish layer, two or three inches of lime, uh, sawdust, sometimes ash, bound together in a sort of semi-solid uh, mass, which is, as the name implies, is to address the transmission of sound between floors. It does have other benefits too, 
It's proved to be quite effective at spreading, uh, preventing the spread of fire, um, and also has a degree of uh, energy efficiency insulation. Um, above that, you've got, again, the softwood tongue and groove uh, layers that go on top of that, um, and the boot is just kind of put there as some, some sort of indication of, of scale. In terms of the, the material, uh, floorboards tend to be the, the, the more knottier timber, so they kept the, the plain, not free timber for shutters and finishing joinery where you need that clean uh, grain to keep the planing simple. And oddly enough, on floorboards, the fact it's got knots there means, in fact, it's quite resistant to uh, quite resistant to wear. So if we go on to the underside of the deafening, then in, in a, on an occasion that you can actually see it, uh, you get uh, what we're seeing here, which is so if you're a mouse underneath that solum looking upwards, uh, you'd see these boards uh, going 90 degrees to the joists and they're holding in the, the deafening boards. Uh, in earlier buildings, these are actually split. They're, they're split with an axe and you can see that very, very rough finish. But probably by about 1850, they were using um, planed and run off cuts of timber. And you can see here, you've got um, kind of big range of, of, of colors and, and off cuts from previous jobs. Generally, ground floors, didn't normally have um, deafening. So this picture is slightly unusual, which is why I, I kept hold of it. Um, but not almost always as part of the intermediate floor. And again, as I said, full um, for sound transmission. So that's the kind of outline of, of the sort of timber floor scenario. And I'll pass over to Leela, who will then talk about defects, repairs, and other bits that go with it. Over to you, Leela. So to touch a bit on repair and maintenance, so generally in all floors, especially where there's high foot traffic, there may be badly worn timber and it may need to be replaced. But generally the best thing you can do is reuse old timber and you won't get a better quality. Common issues include insect attack. So flooring timber is often of uh, softer sapwood, which given the right conditions of increased humidity is prone to attack from insects, especially wood beetle. Uh, especially, this is quite frequently seen when uh, old linoleum floor coverings have been lifted and some wood beetle damage is to be expected in an old floor. But as long as this is confined to small areas and the floor is structurally sound, uh, you just need to do some localized maintenance, uh, a repair, and it should be it should be okay. So with floor coverings, uh, generally thick continuous floor coverings should be used with caution and moderation, especially on ground floors. Thick rubberized carpet underlay can prevent moisture movement and create the right conditions for wood beetle. Uh, so we had a question about that as well, and it's best to maybe choose a uh, higher quality often these have some natural ingredients um so preferably go with these and also think about vocs which are volatile organic compounds which can be found in cheaper ones and they can cause problems with breathing and asthma and allergies um so and in the past linoleum coverings exacerbated these issues with um with i guess moisture and now vinyl and laminated floors can cause similar uh, difficulties with uh, minor repairs now holes and gaps should be repaired with small timber patches smaller holes and cracks can be repaired with proprietary filler and wider gaps um, between boards can be repaired with thin strips of softwood glued into the gap when relaying make sure you you nail uh, you fix into the joist not the void uh, you may need things like um, bridging pieces to create, to have an, a wider area to, to fix uh, your floorboards or what is called duangs, which we have an image to, and these are used to basically stiffen the joists um, and the floor. Now, I will touch a little bit on insulation, although we will have a separate session that will be uh, dedicated to energy efficiency measures. So generally, just think about that a cold floor absorbs heat and can reduce cold air from below the floorboards. So this is significantly affecting our thermal comfort. Uh, cold feet will mean that you feel cold no matter what the temperature in the air is. So insulation of floorboards is quite important. And it can be done either on the underside or by lifting the floorboards, but the most effective option is installed below a timber floor. 
And it is best to choose a material which allows some degree of uh, moisture movement to avoid accumulations of moisture, which may need to uh, lead to rot uh, and other forms of damage. Uh, hemp bats and wood fiber boards have been used in our uh, trials and love the projects we've done. And they seem to be appropriate for the installation of timber floors. If you are a bit more technical, a high U value can be achieved with these. And you don't need to have a control, a vapor control barrier layer because that's effectively done by the material itself because it's breathable and natural. And the existing floorboards can be reused and relayed. So that's a little bit of info on insulation from me. And before we go into stone floors, I just wanted to check if there are any questions about timber floors. That's good. We're tight for time on this. Yeah, maybe um, we, we actually received some questions from Twitter and Facebook. So I'm just going to go through them. So question from Twitter by John Robinson. Um, it's about the voids between floors and whether it's possible to run new soils and extractor pipes without tearing down neighbor ceilings and floors and legal boundaries. Um, so yes, what do you think, Roger? <laughs> Um, yeah, no, fair question. Um, the exact legal boundary between the two flats is not my area. You might have to ask a lawyer about that. I think intervening for that, working from underneath would be quite difficult. Um, you're certainly interacting with your own ceiling. A lot of ventilation is, is, is framed, uh, is boxed in at going sideways out through a, a sort of cord opening. So without sort of seeing the context, I probably wouldn't be able to go into too much detail there but you're right there is a legal position as to where does your flat stop and your neighbors begin uh, yeah i mean and commonly these are just uh you just fix boxes into your own ceiling rather than going into sort of other other uh, flats uh we had another question from facebook from ian uh he was asking about underfloor board insulation, which we touched a bit on, and if it's recommended and worth doing. Just to reiterate that we've done a lot of our projects, and at the moment, this and hemp pads are our preferred sort of options. Um, we explained about breathability or, um, the, you know, the fact that they allow uh, vapor to move through them. Uh, another yes, question. Um, just to route people to the refurbishment case studies that describe that, so the one for Annette Road, uh, describes uh, wood wood fiber insulation going under floor as well as Hollywood Park Lodge. And yeah, just going think... back to the earlier question, the earlier question about the the ventilation duct. Of course, you'd you wouldn't have much room up there because you're probably going to bump into their deafening. And if you start hacking away at that, um, then you start introducing noise issues, which I know we've got a question on as well. Yeah, which I, I was going to get into that, but I, we also forgot to put a link. We have a link to our case studies uh, and one that showed I showed before, there were two photos of uh, a floorboard, which basically they were the old floorboards at Holyrood Park Lodge in Edinburgh, and they were reused and relayed in a different floor because we actually put insulation underneath. Um, and there's another photo that we show the Dwangs. These are both taken uh, from the case study for Holly Park Lodge. And I, we have a link for that, which we can give to people. Um, I think you put it in the comments. And then, yeah, the next question was about um, reducing footfall noise between two separate floors. Yeah. Um, and, and, there yeah, rubber matting. Yeah, there's when you get sometimes people put laminate floors down above your tenement above a flat and you hear them packing around. There are foam layers that have been offered up to go underneath that um, that laminate flooring. Um, carpets have, uh, are a good option, and in, with an intermediate floor, you don't have many vapor considerations, so you could go for quite a thick underlay and quite a thick carpet. Um, of course, if it's the folk above you tapping away and you're hearing it through your ceiling there's not a whole lot that i can suggest it becomes a almost an uh, a, a neighborhood um or a neighbor uh, discussion as opposed to a physical measure um you might find the reason for that is that the deafening above has been 
uh, mucked up by later services and things. But of course, the burden you're asking them to fix their flaw and their deafening, which of course their their interest in doing so is is a wee bit is a wee bit limited. Um, we've got quite a few questions coming through there. Um, yeah. Should so, I just catch a couple of those now quickly, do you think? Yeah, there's one on recommendations for filling gaps on a timber floor, which we touched a bit on, uh, but it depends how big the holes and the cracks are. Yeah, so the, you can... the, the trick with that is to cut um, narrow fillets of, of timber from an old board, but make them angled so they're like little tiny wedges about um, sort of four mil at the top and uh, going down to three mil at the bottom. So you, you taper it in with glue, tap it down, let the glue set and then plane off the uh, it stands proud um what else wood fiber on the external wall is that a question we should be yes um, well it's for it's for another session we'll talk about walls uh and we or we can do that offline uh on like an email short, short answer is if your wall's dry it should be fine and your wall on the inside shouldn't be wet and if it is you've got real problems a separate discussion um central heating and floorboards um People do put, have much higher temperatures now, and the uh, floorboards will will shrink a little. Generally, that's probably happened already. Um, I suspect that that, that, that movement has been taken up. Um, sometimes if you go into a house that's been empty for a while and, and it's been perhaps a little bit damp or a higher humidity level, um, they might you might lose a mineral millimeter or two between each one. And over the long term, as the pine and the resins in the in the board dry off, they will shrink quite a bit. So we are kind of in that that, that long slip sliver of timber wedges that I that I mentioned. Oh, long question on a manse, Leila. Which one's that? Yeah, so that's Doug Me Megan or Megan on Facebook. Uh, they have Victorian manse, uh, 1865, with traditional timber joist construction floors. They have a lot of impact noise coming through from a section of narrow carpeted first floor hallway to the ground floor. If we can recommend any fixes. Has, I wonder if the house has been divided up. So these are folk above or is this, um, I would check the deafening is, is the first answer, but of course you need to lift the floorboards to that. Um, the other options are carpeting and on intermediate floors that's you know, there's no real limit on that, but it's carpeted already, as they note. Um, the first floor hallway to the ground floor. Um, not terribly. It sounds like um, there's a bit more void in there than there should be. So I'd be perhaps look, looking at the deafening and seeing if any plumbers or electricians have been there smashing, smashing things up, perhaps a bit more than they should have done. Yeah, I think we're going to take a last question here, maybe move on, um, yeah. which from Jean McKenzie on Facebook. She has a leaking, she had a, a leaking water pipe inside a wall for several weeks last September. And she'd like to ask if she needs to get an inspector to the cellar to check that the floorboards or joists have dried out properly. It's a ground floor tenement flat with cellar underneath. Um, very, very interesting question and, and kind of one of these core sort of defects that will always can catch you up. But the good thing is you've noticed it and, and had it addressed. Um, it rather depends on how quickly that masonry and adjacent timber is going to dry out. If, if you're in a reasonably well heated space and well ventilated, the building or the masonry that got damp will dry out much as it did when the building was, was built with wet mortar and wet stone back in the day. Um, it might be an idea to get yourself there close up with a torch and just get a feeling for, for any dampness there. And if you get the feeling there is, you, as you say, you might want to get uh, a, a surveyor in to look at it um, kind of in, in a bit more in a bit more detail. But generally, these things will solve themselves because they dry out surprisingly quickly, um, as long as the water pipe wasn't leaking for you know too too long. Okay, so we move on to stone floors. Sure, let's go right down then. So um, I, I, I mentioned briefly that uh, we, we've we've got a uh, the manse, sort of the default manse with it. Often um, sandstone or a near slate, sometimes a sort of hard where it's compressed further. Um, generally laid on 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 a, on a lime mortar bed with some makeup of clinker or ash. Um, whether that was for some form of moisture protection or that was a convenient sort of aggregate material that was that was available. Um, in this image that you can see, the, these are uh, Craigleith sandstone, 
uh, laid in a in a property in Edinburgh. Very tight joints, fairly smooth. They've been kind of scrubbed quite clean, so those are sort of rather lighter. Normally, um, if they're sort of uh, traditionally polished, they're, they're they're much darker. But that's kind of matter for you, really. Um, also found on intermediate floors, so it's not not always a ground floor thing. There's many uh, tenements in Scotland with with the stone uh, landings, and then sometimes the the actual hallway still still has that. The the next image shows the uh, the, the the a very sort of simplified drawing of the mounting of the flagstones. Oh, back one, where you've got the um, the larger dots are representing the clinker, and then you've got the earth underneath, and they normally butt up quite closely even old ones uh, and i'll show you an, an image of, a, of 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 what they of what they really looked like back in the day generally it wasn't crazy paving uh, normally the they are in straight lines and and the image from fairly castle shows this when some excavation work was done a few years ago you can just about make up the the, the lines so this is about probably probably from the 1550s maybe maybe even earlier Obviously, they're pretty damaged, but you can you can see the lines of how it was laid. So resist the temptation to um, have have, um, have have patio paving because it, it it wasn't really like that. Um, obviously, quite a lot of impact damage here. So that that how that's addressed is is perhaps something to 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 think about. But um, often they're they're finished with a traditionally finished with a, um, a linseed oil and turpentine. Sort of light mix that then soaks in a little bit. Uh, the sur surplus is wiped off, and that cures and and dries, and then you polish it. There are modern uh, acrylic finishes, which I'm not quite such a fan of, or they do give a bit of a shine. Uh, they can be quite thick, um, so I'd I'd kind of stick with the traditional finish. Um, Historic England were on the the news this morning with with traditional cleaning and. And, and house house polishing solutions, which is sort of slightly relative to this. Um, so uh, that's that's really kind of the, the sort of core bits of of, of the stone floor. And then um, Leela can touch on on repair options and common defects, and we can take some questions uh, at the end of that little session. Okay, so a lot of uh, stone floors today are covered with carpets, linoleum in the past, etc. So there might be some glue residue, cement or other level inscrit compound found when you remove these. So you can soak these in water or use a wallpaper uh, steam stripper to assist when, when scraping these. Or rubbing with a soft brick uh, or a piece of sandstone and water helps clean and also even up the surface. Generally, cracked stones should be checked to see if there's any underlying reason or, um, or it's simply wear and tear. And um, repair and maintenance, uh, replacement, sorry, of badly broken or missing pieces should be done by a stonemason if that's needed. And they can cut uh, new or reclaimed slabs to suit the, the space and to the required size. Repointing of joints and making good any cracks or splits should be done using a lime mortar. Uh, this is usually in a form of lime putty with added sand in the case of wider joints. They're generally not high maintenance or not very high maintenance. Uh, they last quite a long time. They resist most staining and splashes, uh, but they will go a bit opaque in um, on prolonged exposure to water. So when you're cleaning them, just don't don't use water excessively. The surface can be easily brushed and wiped as uh, required. And this is also to avoid buildup of moss and algae if we're talking about external sort of floors. With regards to ongoing care, occasional waxing with a beeswax based uh, floor polish might be appropriate. Also linseed oil was originally used, but it does give a um, slightly darker appearance. And if we're thinking about insulating uh, these solid floors, so these are commonly, they, they used to be insulated by replacing an existing concrete floor with the same material laid over a phenolic foam or polystyrene insulating layer. Um, whilst this is, this is thermally effective, it's not vapor permeable. And we are talking about traditional buildings and they work differently, which we will touch on on a different session. Uh, so 
so doing this could lead to water concentration at the base of the walls. So there are a couple of uh, options for insulating these uh, solid floors, and you can either use insulation boards like aerogel, or you can have a lime concrete floor. Uh, this can be done either by mixing the insulation material uh, like hemp or recycled glass in the, in the sort of lime concrete, or by laying an insulated layer on its own and then putting the lime concrete uh, layer on top. Um, such a layer is what you can see in the, on the image, which is called LECA, Lightweight Expanded Clay Aggregate. And this is quite a good option for underfloor heating. The, the range of suppliers who give specifications for concrete work and the heating coils that go with them, so that's, you can consult them for that. But there are many, many options for these and replacing a concrete floor with an insulated lime concrete floor retains the ability to absorb and release moisture. So it does improve the thermal performance of the building, but it also allows the, the building to be, to be healthy. With uh, flagstone floors, it's similar to what I just explained. Uh, they can be lifted and relayed on a lime concrete floor base. Um, we have an example of an image that we actually use insulated lime concrete with flagstones on top from the, the garden bossy in Dumfries House. Sorry, this is an image actually showing uh, the lime the lime concrete floor being laid on Downey's Cottage. That's another project we did, and it's been uh, written up as a case study. Uh, again, we'll put the link to that. Um, and you can see that during the works, uh, and that was after we put some underfloor heating. Uh, I think we have an image for an underfloor heating, don't we? Just to show people. Yes, that's the one. Uh, so you can see how the coil basically goes under, and then you place the lime cream on top of this. And uh, yeah, the, the the image that we have also next is uh, a lime concrete with flagstones on top, and just to show you the finished sort of product. Um, so that's again a little bit of information on that, and happy to take questions. And I think we have quite a few. But um, if there if there are questions that are related to timber floors, we might leave them for the end just to keep, uh, to keep things on, on topic. And there okay, is actually so, one yeah. from, yeah, from Richard. They have a 30, 100 plus stone house in Orkney. The previous owner has run concrete on the floor and they're looking to remove this and put down expanded clay insulation, membrane, lime concrete and underfloor heating with mm. stone slabs on top. <clears throat> Is there anything that we need to take into account for the walls in regards to the heat from the underfloor heating? Um, we can send the case study uh, to you as well, just to have a look. Yeah, so this is, um, so taking out a concrete floor, which is probably a good idea because there's probably no insulation under it, putting down the, the lecker or that, um, concrete and heating slabs on top, so the thermal barrier between the wall and the and the floor, it is talked about and it is done. Personally, I think it's it's it, it's a factor. Often there's a cork strip put around the edge of the lime concrete as a way of giving some form of thermal break between the wall. But but in reality, the, the, the heat will spread from the floor and, and it will go into the wall anyway. Um, Downey's Cottage case study do, does does almost what you're describing there. So perhaps have a Perhaps have a read of that and see what you think, and then get back to us on that. Um, do, so that's that one. Is the one? Do I see one about limecrete or concrete? Um, yes. Uh, normally, the, the the concrete will be much harder. Uh, it'll probably have ordinary pebbles and uh, uh, normal sort of aggregate in it. Uh, a lime concrete will be much easier to chip at. Uh, be a light, generally a lighter color. So. A, a, a whitish color as opposed to a gray of the concrete. Um, concrete will also probably have traces of a plastic DPC sticking up around the edge, which can also give you a bit of a clue. Um, generally, it's unlikely to be limecrete, I suspect, unless you've um, bought a house from a conservation buff like me. Uh, so yeah, probably concrete. Hit it with a hammer, you'll soon get a feeling for how soft it is or hard it is. 
Do we want to just catch on the timber floor ones while we're still here? Um, yeah, uh, we have a question about a uh, best way to get access to under the floor for running cables, but we don't know if um, it's a timber floor or, or um, I'm guessing timber floor. I think it's the timber one. Um, th th this is an area you can really smash the place up with with the best of intentions. And some some electricians, you know, they want to get the cables in. They're not too bothered by the floor. Um, there is a joiner's uh, tool. It's like a circular saw hand operated about the size of a about the size of a side plate that cuts a very neat uh, gap in the in the in the fillet between the two planks and then the same again is done at right angles and then you can lift a really neat carefully cut uh, length of of floorboard up do your cable work and then brace this uh, this cut out piece back in obviously another one at the other end but try and get the joiner to do that work not the electrician because the joiner will do a better job. Um, uh, we have another question that? about uh, ash. Oh yeah, in right. So if it's ash, it's what you're probably seeing is some form of, of deafening. Um, normally the deafening is in a matrix, so it was laid wet like a like a sort of um, almost a sort of sand and cement mix. Um, I would suggest leaving it in because to take it out is a whole lot of work. And you will pay quite a lot of money for a modern equivalent like Quietex, which is effectively the same thing, but you just pay for it in a bag. So I would fill up the gaps with some with an alternative, and that could be that could be sand and hydrated lime with a bit of sawdust as as a sort of filler in, or you could buy some Quietex, which is a loose material. So you might want to think about a binder and and just patching it up. Um, but you're right to say about longevity, you, you don't want to be doing this work again. Um, if what you've got has been there for 100 years, I suspect it's good for another 100 years going forward. I, I think that's all for now. So maybe we can move oh. on to uh, ceramic floors or tile floors. Right. OK, so this is the last um, in our little sort of simplified sequence. And uh, this seems to have got a bit of a little bit of publicity recently. So what we're talking about with ceramic floors is actually a, a mixture of what can be clay, plain clay tiles. It can be mosaic, which is cut little squares of stone. It can be encaustic tiles, which are essentially fired ceramic with the pattern, um, which came in about 1850 by, by a manufacturer called Minton, um, copying often medieval patterns. And you can also have what are called geometric tiles, which are um, the brightly colored ceramic pieces, which you um, which you see. And to some extent in Scotland, they're the most common. They're the ones you see in your in your granny's front hall or in the um, doorway of many shops and things. Most of these of these are bedded, uh, bedded on a concrete slab of some sort uh, in a cement or a lime paste. And they got um, Pretty heavily covered up in the 1960s when uh, they didn't they weren't quite so keen on Victorian stuff so this image here is showing you um, a mixture of encaustic tiles which are the uh, the ones with the patterns on and that um, that cross flower motif which is essentially inspired from a, a medieval design uh, and then the the more geometric ones which are the just straight cut what are called geometric tiles and these are now of uh, copies of these or, or re reproductions are are, of, are available of these now. Um, that picture was um, from my neighbor's house uh, in a house north of Perth. The way these tiles are set um, is kind of similar to, to the lime concrete thing, really. You've got all the lime, the, the flagstones, is you've generally got some form of, of, of ash uh, and a concrete layer or a lime concrete layer, depending on the date. Um, and they're set in a very fine um, paste. Uh, normally, it's a fine cement paste. And again, this is a grossly simplified drawing, but I've tried to show the, the little squares of, of material sitting on their base, and then the skirting um, interacts and, and junks up in the, in the normal way. The, the, a closer, for a closer view of a, of a geometric uh, tile, uh, with a, an encaustic tile is in, in this image here. And again, you can see the, um, the, the sort of medieval inspired patterns and also the very bright colors because ceramic 
is is pretty hard and 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 pretty durable um and and they polish and shine up really nicely so they keep their color after hundreds of years of of feet and stamping the odd crack and things which you're seeing here not 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 a not a big deal really um so my final um final floor sort of variant of this before i just show you a couple of examples is uh what we sometimes call clay or quarry tiles which are the the quite common red ones that whether these are, are seriously old or whether they're a kind of arts and crafts 1900 um intervention i don't know i'm sure someone can tell me but but perhaps basic clay fired might have a glaze on top but that might have worn off a little bit and you can see that in the lower part of the image it, it, it's got a powdery non-bright look to it whereas where the glaze is intact on the others they're in slightly better condition um just by ways of of, of examples then of of some earlier versions the the next slide will show you the um, some medieval tiles so this is the original encaustic which were excavated from the ruins of Melrose Abbey down in the Scottish borders. So um, again, these lozenge, diamond lozenges laid tight together um, a little bit like that. And then I did mention um, there is a, a, a proper mosaic uh, tradition and there's plenty of examples in Scotland, mostly from the 19th century where you've got little squares of, of cut marble and other stones laid on the, the lime concrete or, or, the, or the cement based concrete um and they work very well until until the matrix breaks up and then of course it all um, comes away so so that's just a, another sort of floor variant but uh, not not quite so many of not quite so many of those um so that's probably a, a, enough on 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 that typology and uh Leela can cover um some of the repair aspects now yeah so as roger mentioned uh these these floors are quite robust um but it's best to don't to not not to use abrasives or they will scratch. Uh, but they usually scratch already. Uh, plastic or wood scrapers are preferable, uh, or you can use alkali-based cleaners such as nitromores or acid-based cleaners uh, to remove if you have cement from any works that you've done or plaster spots. Uh, but don't use too much. For any loose tiles that remain in the original position, an acrylic resin or PVA glue is a good way of consolidating them in situ. Or if you have like larger areas, um, you can you will probably need to regrout them. And this can be done with a, a tinted tile grout or a fine cement paste. After you've done the work, uh, you can bring up the color of the of the floor by wiping with a boil linseed oil, sort of similar to what we spoke about earlier, uh, but uh, linseed oil and a turpentine mix. Avoid, if you can, acrylic coatings. They're usually too thick, they will chip and scratch. Uh, and you can also use wax polys. Now, in terms of insulating them, obviously that can be harder, but it's a similar to solid floors we spoke earlier. There are a few options for upgrade, and they can be reset, or they can be reset on a new base. New pieces for geometric tiles are available from Jackfield Tile Museum, if you need any. And I think, yeah, everything else is, is more or less the same as we mentioned before, the, the approaches you would take to upgrade these floors. And we can take some questions, I think, now. So we have a question from Paul Patras on YouTube. Can we offer any advice on bathroom tiling in tenement buildings? I am assuming this is floor tiling. Um, yeah, this is quite a hard one because you, you've always got a lot of water swelling around. You're generally laying the tiles on a timber substrate, whether that's the original uh, timber boards or whether that's on the plywood. You will always get some degree of movement and getting once you get water on a floor underneath the tiles, it then kind of hangs around on the timber and that doesn't normally work in the long term so floor tiling is quite it's fine people do it but it needs to be pretty pretty careful on a very uh, solid substrate if we're talking vertical tiling so either side um and it's new well that's kind of normal rules apply really but for modern tiling there's not not a huge amount to add um, in terms of that um often there are quite a few modern systems now where you put it on a waterproof board 
that sits away from the original wall so that you don't get um, get water seeping through onto your onto what would have been lath and plaster or, or your wall of some sort. And we have a question from Jean McKenzie. Um, there is a solid concrete slab inserted into the kitchen floor, which presumably supported the range in the original build, uh, which is one um, inch or so higher than the floorboards. How big a job is to remove the slab, or should I just put up with it? If it if it's concrete, it's probably not original. Um, there is a there has been a sort of habit over the last couple of couple of decades of of raising hearth slabs up by an inch or two above the floor which was which was never done in the past um, if you're lucky you may be able to it may actually be sitting on on a on a on the stone uh, hearth slab and if you're even luckier it might have cracked itself away and you can quite literally just prise that off in in a single lump I, i've i've done it myself a couple of times and it can happen um, if it comes off away nicely and you have stone underneath, that's all very easy. Um, if it's bedded into where the stone was, i.e. it's now going down into the floor and connecting with with, with the solemn uh, masonry, that's a, that's a kind of bigger job. Um, not impossible, but uh, it depends how badly you want to do it. Okay. Let's see if we have any other questions. Because uh, now, I mean, we've kind of covered all, all the areas we wanted to cover and we're happy to to kind of dive into. Yeah, we've got time for any detail. We've questions? yeah, <laughs> ten minutes so far away. Did we catch those earlier questions? Uh, I think Just we did. I think we did. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yes, we did. And annoyed. just just. Just to reiterate that we will have a separate session uh, and we will cover sort of insulation op options for traditional buildings or energy efficiency measures, which is quite a hot topic right now. So it will be coming. Good. OK, well, I think that's that looks like the end of the questions then. So the, the literature that all this is the Inform Guide series. So. Um, they were written when I had a bit more hair. Um, so we've got we've got one on ceramic tiles, we've got timber floors, we've got sandstone floors. Um, we don't have much uh, specific on lime concrete unless it's covered um, unless it's covered in the refurbishment case studies. And I think probably the ones you're going to from the questions that we've been having is Downey's Cottage, which is the Highland Croft that was redone a few years ago, and the um, uh, that's sorry that's case study 22 and then we showed an image of case study 8 which is the garden bothy in Dumfries house which is the the flagstones on top of the insulated lime concrete so that's also a useful yeah. one and um, hollywood park lodge for the wood fiber flooring under the floor and annette road for wood fiber under the floor as well yeah we should put the links in the chat shouldn't we that would be a good idea wouldn't it Yes, I think I think uh, they are uh, on the on the sort of external external um, on the comments. Um, so if we don't have any um, any more, oh, I think there is a question coming up. Yeah, we're happy we're happy to take uh, a few more questions if there are. Okay, so Graham Sweeney on Facebook, uh, he's getting mice undermining the flagstones. Are there any treatments to stabilize this? All oh, right, um, that's interesting. Um, I would be thinking of a of a lime grout. So, getting some whatever lime you can get hold of, be it hydrated lime from your ordinary builders merchant, be it a hydraulic lime in a bag that you can you can get from key lime builders merchants, mixing it with uh, with enough water to get a a sort of consistently a bit like a bit like double cream so that you can pour it uh, and then basically fill up the holes uh, having distracted the uh, the little fellas away with something um, then you can just fill up fill up the holes if you don't want to do that the other way is to put uh, steel wool in the holes um, they just don't like chewing it and that um, apparently um, 
gives quite a good block. Well, I've done it myself and it works. Um, okay, I think maybe that's all, all we have time for, I, unless we do get a, a one final question, but I don't think, I think that's all for today. So, unless Roger has said something. Uh, thank you, Roger, and thank you to everyone who tuned in for this event. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it. And if you did enjoy, you can leave a comment and follow for more. Now we have a feedback form as well, which will be embedded somewhere down there. And next time we're planning to talk specifically about roofs, a uh, similar layout again. Uh, so roofs and all things related for our next talk, that's going to be on the 30th of April at 3 p.m. Uh, you can send in questions beforehand if you want in advance by, e by emailing technicalresearch at hs.scot. So uh, thank you for joining us and enjoy the rest of our informed Fridays. Goodbye. Cheers, team. Bye.